from the introduction by J. Glenn Gray. If the most thought-provoking thing about our thought-provoking age is that we are still not thinking, it has always been thus since the early Greeks. As he makes clear in this volume, Heidegger is neither pessimistic nor optimistic about the times in which we live. It is only that the nature of our technological age requires thinking more than earlier ages. For modern man conceives himself prepared to take dominion over the earth, and his capacities for good and ill are vastly augmented. Furthermore, Heidegger makes no claim that thinking can produce knowledge as do the sciences, nor can it promote usable practical wisdom, solve any cosmic riddles, or endow us directly with the power to act. There is no salvation to be found in it. In all these ways, it is clearly inferior to the sciences and to all these activities which commonly pass for thinking. Nevertheless, thinking in his sense does have its own importance and relevance. Heidegger is clearly working toward a theory of the independent role of a kind of thinking that is at once poetic and philosophic. Philosophy as an autonomous inquiry. For Heidegger, thinking is a response on our part to a call which issues from the nature of things, from being itself. It involves not only man's receptivity to being, but also being's receptivity to man. The history and situation of man in a given age often covers up the nature of reality and renders it impossible to receive the message of being. Heidegger's conception of truth as the revealing of what is concealed in distinction to the theory of truth as correctness or correspondence is probably his most seminal thought and philosophy's essential task as he sees it. The nature of reality and of man is both hidden and revealed concomitantly. The final lecture in this volume brings this out most clearly. It represents his attempt to translate the famous saying of Parmenides about the relation of saying and thinking to being. What Heidegger is here suggesting is that thinking is a concrete seeing and saying of the way the world is. Man is an integral part of this world and can realize it by asking questions of it, profound and naive questions, and by waiting even a whole lifetime for the disclosures that may come. It is a calling. The more thoughtless we are, the less human we are. Every doctrine of man's nature, as he tells us in these lectures, is at one and the same time a doctrine of being. And every doctrine of being is, by the same token, a doctrine of human nature. As we learn in the opening sentence, we come to know what thinking means when we ourselves try to think. To define thinking for someone else would be as hopeless as describing colors to the blind. Each must learn to do it for himself. For Heidegger, questioning is a way or path of thinking each one must clear for himself with no certain destination in mind. It might be likened to making a first path on skis through new fallen snow or clearing a way for oneself through dense forest growth. Questioning and thinking are not a means to an end. They are self-justifying. But the way changes frequently, since he often gets into bypaths and dead ends. His persistence in holding to the question he has chosen to think about, as well as his flexibility in approach to it, are sources of admiration even among the ranks of his detractors. It is a fundamental mistake to read Heidegger as a follower of this or that previous thinker. He seems to me to have no basic dependence on any predecessors, not even his own previous thought. If his thinking is never carried on in disregard of the tradition, he is rarely satisfied with the conclusions of others, nor after a time with his own. 
Close students of his well realize how far he has come since being in time. However, they may divide on the question of whether there has been a decisive turn since that early work. Today, at age 79, he starts every morning afresh without any secure base in past systems of thought and still dissatisfied with what he himself has worked out. The only way to go forward is to return to the origins and seek a new beginning. The advance Heidegger wishes to make is to learn to think non-conceptually and non-systematically about the nature of being. By doing so, he hopes to avoid the subjectivity involved in separating human being and being with a capital B, subject and object. He desires a thinking that is at once receptive in the sense of a listening and attending to what things convey to us and active in the sense that we respond to their call. Only when we are really immersed in what is to be thought can we reveal truly the nature of anything, no matter how commonplace it may be, and only then can we avoid our habitual ways of grasping it, as it is for us, that is, subjectively. The call of thought is thus the call to be attentive to things as they are, to let them be as they are, and to think them and ourselves together. This is, of course, difficult, all the more so as Heidegger believes in this man-centered age of ours. It is an age in which we consider it quite in order that we cannot all follow the thought processes of modern theoretical physics. But to learn the thinking of thinkers is essentially more difficult, not because that thinking is still more involved, but because it is simple. Man is naturally inclined to think and being desires to be thought truly. Every genuine thinking is ambiguous in its very nature. Multiplicity of meanings is the element in which thought must move in order to be strict thought. He thinks poetically, all the more the older he becomes. Heidegger rarely abandons the idiom idiomatic sense of a German word, no matter how technical or terminological its overtones. He has great respect for the common idiom, though none at all for the commonness of thoughtless usage. Keep uppermost the simple, non-technical sense of what he is trying to say. This way, it is easier for the philosophically sophisticated reader to supply the contemporary technical connotations of these words and for the layman in philosophy not to miss the essential message of this book. This may well be the first Heidegger translation in English to be worked out in close cooperation with the author.